we are going to know about uh, lentic water ecosystems uh, otherwise uh, they may be also asked uh, in the examination as a uh, write about lake ecosystem or pond ecosystem so uh, in the previous videos <coughs> we have seen about the classification of natural ecosystems so in this uh, aquatic ecosystems freshwater ecosystems marine water ecosystems and estuarine water ecosystems are there uh, we have already discussed about marine water ecosystem and estuarine water ecosystem in today's class uh, we are going to discuss about inland water ecosystem in inland water ecosystem three types of uh, uh, inland water ecosystems or freshwater ecosystems are there uh, out of them lotic ecosystem is one in today's class we are going to know about lotic water ecosystems <coughs> Uh, sorry, lentic water ecosystems. So, what are lentic uh, water ecosystems? Lentic water ecosystems uh, uh, is one type of uh, freshwater ecosystems. Other types are lotic and uh, wetlands uh, are two other types of uh, freshwater ecosystems. So, these are uh, lentic water, uh, the total freshwater ecosystems including uh, lotic and wetlands. Uh, they cover about uh, nearly 6% of identified species. So all these uh, around 1 lakh species of organisms uh, are living in uh, these three types of uh, freshwater ecosystems. So uh, lentic water ecosystems are uh, uh, standing bodies of water. The water in them usually it will not uh, flow like uh, in rivers and streams. So it will be static or stagnant water. And examples for this lentic water ecosystems are ponds and lakes. And the uh, uh, sizes of these uh, lentic water ecosystems, they range from uh, some uh, water ecosystem, some lentic water ecosystem will be a less than a hectare. And uh, the biggest uh, or largest lentic water ecosystem uh, will spread over an area of uh, several hundred hectares also. So in size wise, they range from less than a hectare to several hundred hectares coming to depth wise in depth uh, some lentic water ecosystems they may have a depth of uh, 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 several uh, meters only and the largest uh, uh, largest uh, lentic water ecosystem they may have uh, several hundred meters uh, the biggest uh, lentic water ecosystem is uh, baikal lake uh, which is located in russia it is having around some two or three kilometers of depth so in depth wise also they are having a wide range from starting from a several meters of depth to several hundred and several thousands of uh, uh, several uh, thousand meters of depth also are there so that is the range of these uh, uh, lentic water ecosystem uh, in depth wise <clears throat> and uh, these lentic water ecosystems they exist all over the world so they are located in uh, temperate areas they are located in tropics they are located in subtemperate areas are also so all over the world uh, we can see these lentic water ecosystems and these lentic water ecosystems they provide essential resources uh, uh, for both terrestrial organisms and aquatic organisms aquatic uh, aquatic organisms we know definitely they will live in uh, water habitats only but coming to terrestrial uh, uh, um, animals or terrestrial organisms some of them they are amphibious uh, so one stage of their life will be uh, completed or uh, uh, will be present in water bodies so such type of uh, amphibious organisms are also will be provided uh, by the <coughs> habitats uh, um, by these lentic water ecosystems uh, and uh, these are water lentic water ecosystems that means ponds and lakes they also provide essential resources uh, like uh, they meet the food needs of these both ter terrestrial and aquatic organisms even though some organisms are completely terrestrial they depend on the uh, animals or resources located in these uh, lentic water ecosystems so in this way lentic water ecosystems they provide uh, essential resources and habitats both for uh, terrestrial and aquatic organisms 
and even though they are uh, inhabiting or they are providing a place for 6% of organisms on the whole, only 3% of its surface is uh, uh, covered by these lentic water ecosystems. And uh, these lentic water ecosystems, they have connection with the terrestrial ecosystems also. Uh, actually, lentic water ecosystems, they share, uh, they have a very close connection with these uh, terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, these ponds and lakes, they usually, they receive water from these terrestrial ecosystems only. When it rains, uh, the rainwater will finally uh, go into these lentic water ecosystems by flowing on these terrestrial habitats only. So, through this rainwater, all required nutrients that uh, they will reach into these lentic water ecosystems. So, in nutrients recycling, they have a connection. And the terrestrial organisms also, they receive food, uh, uh, they receive food uh, uh, from these uh, aquatic animals. So, in return, the uh, lentic water ecosystems, they supply food to the terrestrial animals. So, in this way, material supply uh, will be uh, uh, going on in a cyclic way uh, in between these lentic water ecosystems and terrestrial ecosystems. Now, coming to the zonation, like we have seen in the marine uh, uh, ecosystems, uh, here different types of classifications are there. So, according to one classification, the uh, lakes and ponds can be classified into littoral zone, limnetic zone and benthic zone. So here in the east slide you can see littoral zone. It is the peripheral region of this uh, lake or pond and it is very close to the terrestrial uh, borders. So in this littoral zone, a uh, lot of plants will be there. Usually rooted plants will be there and they will be submerged in some cases. They will be... <coughs> emerged out of the waters uh, in some cases and they may be at the end of the or at the borders of these uh, uh, littoral zone also. So littoral zone will be possessing lot of uh, uh, big sized or um, uh, <coughs> highly developed plants uh, in this uh, lakes and ponds. And limnetic zone is the open zone. In marine waters we call it as a pelagic zone here. In uh, freshwater bodies we call them as a limnetic zone. So limnetic zone is the open waters uh, which is located in the middle of these ponds or lakes. And uh, in some cases, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and the third zone is a profundal zone. So profundal zone is the zone just below this uh, 40, uh, limnetic zone. Usually the limnetic zone also may be called as photic zone. Uh, in another type of classification uh, that is done based on the availability of sunlight, uh, the uh, lakes and ponds can be classified into two zones. One is photic zone, second one is aphotic zone. So photic zone is the region where sunlight availability will be there. So this photic zone will be around 200 meters in depth from the top layer of the water. And photic zone comprises both the littoral zone and limnetic zone. So both littoral zone and limnetic zone collectively they may be called as photic zone. Why? Because in these two zones, uh, sunlight availability will be there and they will be <clears throat> extended up to 200 meters of depth uh, uh, in these uh, lakes and ponds. So after that, below this photic zone, the total remaining uh, water um, uh, layers uh, uh, deep inside these lakes are called as aphotic zone. And this aphotic zone is also called as profundal zone according to the uh, depth of these uh, 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 according to the classification based on uh, depth of these different layers of the water body. So uh, in one classification we have uh, four uh, type uh, four types of uh, parts in this uh, zone are four zones in this lakes. One is littoral zone, second one limnetic zone, third one is profundal zone, fourth one is benthic zone. And benthic zone is the substratum and this benthic zone extends uh, starting from the littoral zone to the complete uh, bottom layer of these uh, lakes and ponds. So, benthic zone is spread all over the uh, lake and uh, the uh, bottom most part and the soil part or the substratum part is also is called as benthic zone. So, these are the four types of zones in ben this benthic zone will be inhabiting a uh, lot of uh, different types of organisms uh, in littoral zone, they may uh, harbor, they may harbor or they may provide place for uh, uh, 
phototrophic uh, photo synthetic organisms also but coming to the uh, uh, prefrontal zone in this prefrontal zone photosynthetic uh, or autotrophs will not be there only consumers and uh, detrivores also may be there in the benthic zone and uh, coming to this pro photo uh, coming to the limnetic zone and uh, prefrontal zone in both these zones uh, uh, both autotrophs will be there autotrophs usually they are confined to photic zone only autotrophs photosynthetic autotrophs they are confined to photic zone only up to the region where sunlight availability will be there in those regions only autotrophs will be seen and uh, uh, in both in uh, photic zone and uh, aphotic zone both in these layers animals uh, will be uh, seen in this uh, zone so this is about uh, zonation now in a, uh, one more important uh, find point in this uh, zonation of this uh, lentic water ecosystems uh, is that in photic zone light penetration will be more than 1% uh, in aphotic zone light penetration will be below 1% only and there is one specific uh, term called as compensation depth compensation depth is the region where the rate of photosynthesis will be equal to the rate of respiration rate of photosynthesis that means uh, the rate at which uh, autotrophs are synthesizing uh, carbohydrates is called as rate of photosynthesis and in respiration we know that carbohydrates uh, will be broken down into carbon dioxide water and energy so in the photosynthesis the carbohydrates will be produced in the respiration carbohydrates will be broken down so compensation depth is the region where photosynthesis is equal to the rate of respiration that means here both the productivity by the uh, autotrophs and uh, consumption by the animals will be equal that is called as compensation depth so this compensation depth uh, separates the uh, water lake uh, or pond uh, into two layers above this compensation depth uh, more productive autotrophs will be there so in the upper layers uh, photosynthesis rate will be higher than the rate of respiration and in the below layer of this compensation depth uh, their photosynthesis rate will be lower than the uh, respiration rate so here in the below layers uh, of this uh, compensation depth uh, respiration demands will be higher than the productivity by the autotrophs and uh, coming to the abiotic factors so, so the abiotic factors uh, both in these uh, lakes and uh, uh, ponds uh, can be termed as uh, examples for this abiotic factors are depth temperature dissolved oxygen and carbon dioxide free carbon monoxide organic salts of sodium potassium calcium etc and uh, yeah, sorry inorganic salts of uh, sodium potassium calcium etc and organic compounds of amino acids humidity uh, uh, hum humic acids uh, it is type mistake humic acid etc substratum uh, with uh, minerals and organic debris wind action waves and internal currents and air above the water surface with oxygen and carbon dioxide these are the abiotic factors here we need to discuss about some uh, abiotic factors in detail coming to depth wise uh, so all lentic water ecosystems are not uh, uh, uniform in terms of depth uh, some lentic water ecosystems will be having uh, uh, shallow depths only say for example some ponds they will be having one or two meters depth only whereas the lakes they will be having a uh, uh, more depth than these uh, ponds so <clears throat> depth wise uh, when we see about the depth wise uh, in some cases uh, let us go back to this uh, zonation slide again so in zonation coming to this zonation slide uh, let us take a example of a small pond in small pond we may not see this profundal zone completely why because photic zone will be extended up to 200 meters of depth uh, if a uh, small pond is having uh, just four or five meters of depth uh, there we can see only littoral zone limnetic zone and benthic zone only profundal zone will be missing uh, in such type of small lakes so uh, in this way zonation uh, in zonation we may see some differences or some uh, changes uh, uh, among these uh, in between these ponds and lakes uh, in terms of depth 
and uh, uh, temperature is also will be uh, somewhat controlled by the or somewhat uh, uh, affected by the depth uh, so the penetration of light uh, contributes to the temperature uh, of these waters so when the uh, lakes are uh, uh, very big in size they will be having a uh, more depth uh, so then the deep waters uh, will be having a stable temperatures and usually they will be having a uh, uh, lower temperatures than the upper temperatures and temperature stability also will be there coming to the upper layers in deep lakes uh, upper layers during the daytime they will be more uh, uh, warm and during the night time they will uh, be very cool so temperature variations will be there in the upper layers but this variations uh, will not be there in the lower layers and this temperature variations uh, uh, in uh, uh, lakes where uh, they are located in uh, temperate areas and uh, uh, arctic or uh, subarctic areas uh, there we can see the changes in these temperatures they will uh, create some stratification summer stratification and winter stratification like that so the wind in winter stratification uh, this overturn summer overturn winter overturn will be there so all these things will be resulted uh, by this uh, differences in the depth only and dissolved oxygen and carbon dioxide so these dissolved oxygen carbon dioxide also play very very important role so dissolved oxygen is very essential for respiration uh, purposes and carbon dioxide is required by the organisms uh, uh, that practice for photosynthesis so carbon dioxide will be utilized by the autotrophs oxygen will be utilized by all types of organisms so availability of carbon dioxide is also very very important uh, uh, usually carbon dioxide will be released by uh, animals uh, and this will be utilized by the autotrophs so, so all these uh, overturns uh, winter overturn and summer overturns these overturns they will mix this oxygen top oxygen will be mixed or uh, sent to the lower layers and uh, carbon dioxide uh, from the bottom layers will be brought to the upper layers uh, with these overturns uh. And free carbon monoxide also carbon monoxide also affects the life of organisms so if carbon monoxide percentage is high that will affect uh, the biotic factors life at um, uh, in a big way and uh, many inorganic salts of sodium potassium calcium so these are also very very important role they are very uh, important for the survival of all these biotic uh, components uh, and organic compounds uh, amino acids humic acid uh, all these things they will be released by the uh, decomposers so when the organisms are dead the dead bodies will reach the benthic uh, layer in the benthic layer uh, the benthas organisms usually they are uh, uh, decomposers they will decompose these dead bodies and from this decomposing dead bodies lot of amino acids and humic acid will be released into this layer so these uh, amino acids, uh, humic acid, they will be uh, taken by these animals. So this is also very, very important uh, abiotic factor. And the substratum with minerals and organic debris. So when the dead bodies are decomposed, all these things, uh, they will uh, mix in this substratum layers. And from the substratum, they will be released into the water. From water, they will be taken up by the organisms. Uh, and wind action waves internal currents uh, they are also very very important wind action cannot be seen in uh, ponds in very small ponds there will be no wind action there will be no waves uh, uh, but in big size lakes uh, uh, by wind action small waves can be seen in the lakes and these waves and in some cases internal currents also will be there these internal currents uh, will be due to the temperature changes so due to the temperature changes this overturn of water layers will be there so all these things they will create internal currents so the waves and internal currents are very very important uh, in mixing up these layers and in overturning these uh, lower layers to top layers and top layers to lower layers so all these waves and internal currents wind action they will help in the distribution of equal distribution of uh, all these components like carbon dioxide oxygen salts and uh, organic compounds and air above the water surface also actually this is not uh, a part of the water body 
it is above the water body outside the water body but this is also very very important why because this air layer only is providing oxygen uh, required for these uh, water bodies and uh, carbon dioxide also the carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere also will be dissolved in this uh, <coughs> water bodies and this will be utilized by the autotrophs uh, living in the water bodies so these are the important uh, uh, abiotic factors producers primary producers so all the will synthesize uh, food materials by photosynthesis and uh, the producers in these things can be classified uh, into different uh, types out of them first one is microscopic phytoplankton <clears throat> so the microscopic phytoplankton are very very small in size and most of them will be unicellular organisms uh, euglena valvox eudorina anabina oscillatoria are examples for the microscopic phytoplankton these microscopic phytoplankton uh, these are the microscopic phytoplankton and uh, coming to another type uh, of producers they are macroscopic phytoplankton these macroscopic phytoplankton are big in size they are not unicellular they are multicellular and usually these macroscopic phytoplankton will be filamentous in structure they will not be having any roots and stems like structures examples include uh, Spirogyra, Chara, Edogonium, and Nitella, etc. So we can see this both microscopic phytoplankton and macroscopic phytoplankton, uh, both in lakes and ponds. Uh, coming to another type of uh, uh, autotrophs or producers, that is macrophytes. Macrophytes means uh, big sized plants. So these macrophytes can be uh, classified into three types one is marginal and emergent plants. Second one is submerged plants. Uh, third one is uh, surface floating plants. Uh, and these macrophytes, uh, they are uh, seen usually in uh, ponds only, but uh, in lakes, all these uh, 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 macrophytes may not be seen in some cases, but in some cases, they may be present in pond, uh, lakes also. So usually, they will be definitely uh, seen in ponds. So first type of uh, macrophytes, marginal and emergent plants. So as the name suggests, they are present on the margins of the uh, water body, margins of the pond, and they will uh, emerge from this water bodies. Usually they will be uh, just uh, on the border of the water body. So the roots also will be present in the soil and they are very close. In, only in you know, few seasons, like in rainy season, they will be submerged in the waters in remaining seasons uh, they will be uh, out of the water and very very close to the uh, water body such type of uh, 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 marginal and emergent plants include uh, typha acorus uh, jessia and ipomia and the second type is uh, submerged plants so these submerged plants they will be completely submerged in the water bodies they will be having uh, usually roots some plants may not be having roots also. They will be having roots and they will be completely submerged in the water body or in the pond. Examples are examples for the submerged plants are Wallisneria, Otellia, Potamogeton, Utricularia, and uh, Ceratophyllum. And third type of uh, macrophytes is surface floating plants. The surface floating plants they will be having roots. Uh, they may be having their roots. Uh, uh, in the substratum of the water body but their parts will be uh, floating on the surface layers so the body can be seen they, it will be spread on the water uh, surface uh, in some cases they may not be having uh, a root submerged in the substratum roots will be there but these roots will not be hidden or uh, placed into this uh, water body so examples for the surface floating uh, Macrophytes uh, are Fistia, Pistia, Lemna, uh, Icarnia, uh, sorry, this is a type mistake, Icarnia and uh, Wolfia. These are the examples for surface floating uh, uh, macrophytes. So these are the uh, producers that can be seen in lentic water ecosystems. And coming to the primary consumers, primary consumers uh, include uh, zooplankton and benthas. Uh, zooplankton uh, can be seen both in lakes and ponds. 
zooplankton usually they will feed on uh, phytoplankton all these producers so zooplankton will consume phytoplankton and uh, primary producers so examples for this zooplankton rotifers examples of rotifers are brachionus asplankna lecan and some protozoans like uh, euglena collips and uh, dileptus some crustaceans like cyclops and uh, stenocytris these are examples for the zooplankton and uh, these zooplankton can be seen both in uh, uh, lakes and ponds coming to benthas so benthas uh, as a primary consumers can be seen only in uh, uh, ponds but not in the large size lakes so in lakes benthas will not fall under primary consumers category benthas will be there but these benthas organisms will not make the primary consumers category in big size lakes so benthas usually presents only in uh, benthas will be there in all water bodies but uh, it will be uh, making the primary consumers category only in ponds usually and uh, these benthas usually uh, uh, examples for this benthas are uh, some fish, insect larvae, beetles, mites, molluscans, crustaceans, and snails, tortoises. They usually uh, feed on this zoo, feed on zooplankton or uh, phytoplankton. So when they feed on phytoplankton, they will be called as primary consumers. And when they feed on zooplankton, then they will be called as secondary consumers. So some benthas may be. Uh, 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 used as uh, are, uh, some benthas may be uh, seen as primary consumers at some stages of life in some place in some stages they may be uh, seen as they may be considered as secondary consumers also so benthas as primary consumers usually will be seen in ponds only but not in lakes coming to the secondary consumers Secondary consumers in ponds include hydra, dragonflies, water insects like uh, some giant water bugs, water scorpions, water skaters and water, body, uh, water beetles and uh, some small fishes which feed on these primary consumers. So all these things, all these animals, they will feed on primary consumers, then they will be called as secondary consumers. Uh, so these are the different types of secondary consumers seen in ponds. Coming to lakes. In lakes, uh, the secondary consumers will be present in this benthas, uh, in benthic zone. So all these are called as benthas animals. So benthas animals are secondary consumers in lakes, whereas benthas animals are primary consumers in ponds. So benthas animals in lakes uh, include some planktivorous invertebrates and fish. So these are the secondary consumers in lakes. Coming to tertiary consumers, so tertiary consumers uh, will be the big sized fishes and some water birds like uh, ducks, waterfowls, herons and uh, other carnivores like uh, otters. So otters are one type of uh, mammals, uh, they will be living in water bodies. Uh, so not only these animals, some animals which are living on terrestrial habitats also, they also may occasionally visit these water bodies for uh, hunting or uh, predation. So these are the tertiary consumers coming to decomposers. Decomposers uh, are different types of bacteria, fungi, fungi like Aspergillus, Rhizopus, Pencillium, Alternaria, Trichoderma and some flagellate protozoans. These are decomposers. They will be present in benthic zone both in uh, ponds and lakes. So this is about uh, lentic water ecosystems with this uh, we conclude, uh, we'll meet with another topic in next video.